everything that I have, my whole family has and will continue to have in years to come has been gifted essentially to us through his work. And to this day, we still don't know anything about him or his life. would be uh, running out with Dad for his 300th against Richmond. I can remember uh, that the cheer squad had made a little slit in the banner for me and had Jack labelled above it. Um, but I wanted to do everything like Dad, so we were wearing white shorts that day. So I had to wear white shorts too, and um, I had to go through the banner like all the other players. Seeing highlights of me next to Dad, and it's really, it's almost identical. And that, yeah, that gets me really excited. I've been brought up in a family that's that's pretty heavily publicised. What Mum and Dad have taught me along the way about their experiences and what to expect from the media and whatnot. For me and my debut to be, I guess, portrayed as this big thing as third generation. And here he is, his first touch. Now the Carlton fans love that, there was plenty of them. I can't even explain it. I, I don't know, I don't feel like I've done enough to deserve posters. I feel like I'm taking the place of someone more deserving um, because I'm starting out my career. I've played eight games. I, I'm in, I am owed nothing, I'm entitled to nothing, and I haven't really done enough to warrant such stuff. Footy blood running right through him. He kicks the goal, and every Carlton fan celebrates around Australia. I used to hang posters of Brandon Favola and Chris Jard and stuff in my room, and now Mum's got one of me on the fridge, so it doesn't feel real because um, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's genuine. I don't know if it's parents sort of going, oh, his dad and granddad were really good players for the club. You know, he's got a very famous lineage. You, you know, where his number. And I don't know if they genuinely like me as a player or <laughs> like, I can't sort of comprehend that. In the summer of 1924, a young Italian farm labourer decided to leave his hometown in search of a better life. Had he not made that decision, Sergio Silvani would never have drawn Victoria's burgeoning Italian community to Australian rules football with his continental credentials and hard, no-nonsense approach to the game. Stephen Silvani would never have done battle with some of the greatest forwards in football history and established himself as the fullback of the century. That was absolutely amazing. It's a goal for the Blues. And Jack Silvani would never have played for the team he grew up adoring, the Mighty Blues. That young farmer's name was Giacomo. Giacomo Silvani, or Jack, as he was to be known in later life. But who was Giacomo Silvani? What were the circumstances that led to his migration to Melbourne, Australia, some 16,000 kilometres away from his native Asiago? Jack, Giacomo's great-grandson, has decided to spend his off-season exploring his family's history and learning more about his namesake. His first step is to catch up with Carlton Football Club historian Tony DeBolfo.
G'day, Tony. How are you, Jack? How's things? Very well, thanks. Let's self. go and have a look at one of those Morton Bay fig trees. Sounds good. By all accounts, your great grandfather was supposed to meet a countryman, fellow countryman, that was actually going to guarantee him work and accommodation. So when he didn't front um, at, the, at the dock, Hard to imagine what must have been running through your great grandfather's mind. By the time he got to the, this end of the city, maybe um, you know it was getting dark, and we obviously didn't know the lay of the land or, or where everything was. And he probably saw a tree like this Morton Bay fig and thought, "Well, this is as good a place as any to put down the digs for the first night in Australia." And it's incredible to think that, isn't it? That that first night of the Silvani family uh, was here under one of these trees in the, the Exhibition Gardens, 1924 puts it into perspective because previously I just thought oh, he's sort of migrated and found his way pretty easily but when you come to understand that he spent his night under a tree um, in the gardens and his first ever night here and he, um, he doesn't speak the language, he's unemployed um, so no means of income, he's got no shelter, um, no easy access to food and drinking water, it's, you're essentially you're homeless, and um, I guess that's a pretty scary thought. Courageous and quite heroic to, to make the move, and I guess history tells us that it was the right thing to do. It did work out, and I, I suspect, suspect next generations are, are benefiting from his decision. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Looking back, um, I wouldn't be standing here today, Tony, with you, had um, he not made the move. Yeah, it's, it's hard to think about because it's, yeah, it's pretty special. Jack, there's two items I'd like to show you now. The first is a long gone copy of the Argus newspaper, dated Tuesday, September the 23rd, 1924, which was the day that your great grandfather's ship, the Regina d'Italia, arrived in Melbourne. 507 migrants arrived yesterday, of whom about 80 and a few Greeks intend to try their luck in Victoria. So crowded were the passengers' quarters, the temporary sleeping accommodation was fitted up in the hold. And as you can see, it's fairly cramped. 507 migrants in all uh, at sea for 46 days. It's, um, it's hard to imagine. We now go to the original passenger list. It's pretty powerful also to see his name there, isn't it? And, um, amongst the many people that, you know, cast their bread upon the waters and wanted to start again. Yeah, most of the other people have come out with family. Um, and he's one of very few to come out on their own, especially to nothing, like come on his own to nothing. To start a new life, it's unbelievable. Do you think in looking through today at the papers like this and the experiences you've been that it, it readjusts your thinking a little bit about his story or makes you think a bit more about, about his journey? We're so accustomed to the way we live now and for the most part it's a pretty comfortable life um, and then you hear about all the stories and it's pretty hard to put into perspective you know how it's all happened like you can understand oh yeah this bloke went here this bloke took a ship to go to here and whatnot um, but when it's a family member and it's pretty much defined your life in the country you live in at the moment it's um yeah, it definitely hits home so Jack we've had a look at your great-grandfather's arrival um, and we've learnt a little more about his journey but I suspect in many ways you're just about to embark on your own personal journey or odyssey to retrace his footsteps and I guess to return to where the ship first set sail and to go back to the, the homeland to see uh, where he grew up. Um, yeah. That must be um, a, a really exciting um, moment for you and, and an adventure for you I dare say. Him being 22 and me being 18, it's, it's really relatable. Um, I guess the situations were in me going back to see where he came from and him coming to where I live. 
Um, I know and he's sort of done a lot tougher than I have and I will be, but it's going to be exciting and it'll be an eye-opener, that's for sure. Bon viaggio, mate. Grazie. <laughs> bit about my dad. Well, he really didn't talk much about his past. All I know is they just come out of here. I got a, and he brought his brothers down and they were just gonna stay for a few years, send some money back to Italy. And when they were due to go back about 1928, 29, the depression came along and they just bought a car and it would have it would have got nothing for it, so they stayed on. Dad talk much about Italy? No, he didn't talk very much at all. Knew nothing about Italy. Knew nothing about it. what he did, where he come from. Probably because I was growing up in the war years too. I was born 38. You could just keep your just keep your head in. Didn't make a noise. Yes sir, no sir. I think as a kid growing up. I mean, there was a, a little bit of racism sort of coming through, but uh, sport was a way to integrate. It was a great leveller. And it was amazing when you could actually, I mean, and football was a way for me to do that and get accepted in some ways. But you still felt that you were, you were a new Australian. And I used to laugh in my shoes because they were very pointy and different clothes. And, and that's, I really, uh, you know, that really hurt me. I, I can just remember him going, because he, he hadn't bothered to become an Australian citizen, whereas Italian neighbours across the road, who virtually come down at the same time, they'd become, bothered to become Australian citizens, and they were still working with their companies, or still working. So, so he, 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 got, uh, he got considered an alien and was sent away up to Broadford it was, chopping wood. And he said, you're in charge. And I think it might have been four or five or four or something. He was a fantastic man. And even to the point where, you know, his family home, um, he left He left to me. Of which Dad was born in that home. So a house in Canning Street Carlton was left to me. He said he'd leave it, and he did. And even as a kid growing up playing footy, he used to say, I'll give you a dollar for every goal he kicked. Um, which was always nice. So he stopped after I kicked 12 goals one night. <laughs> Might have been 15. <laughs> it's an amazing story when you hear it. And then when you try to put yourself into your shoes and then your dad's shoes, it's, it's difficult. It's something I'm looking forward to exploring. I'm excited for it. I think I'm... I'm I'm really interested in the historical part of the family, so I hope he can really embrace that because it's a really good story to hear and um, to go back to where it all began is really exciting. You wish I was, I was coming? Yeah. You do? Uh. <laughs> Have a nice trip, Jack. Have a nice trip. <laughs>it was pretty eye opening because I didn't know how old he was um, when he came out. I had no idea if he came out with people he knew um, and what he was coming to. Um, so to get sort of a greater understanding of that and grasp the whole concept of he had nothing to come to. He essentially came with no one he knew. Um, his sponsor didn't pick him up so he was sort of left in the lurch a bit um, and that was the biggest thing I took out of it because at 22, which is four years older than I am at the moment, it's, um, it's pretty scary. It would be very scary now. I can't imagine doing it. Looking forward to sort of getting on the plane knowing once we're over there, um, doing a little bit more research um, into the life of my great granddad and the fact that sort of my family stemmed from, you know, or 
their whole life was there prior to coming out here. And it's pretty interesting, so looking forward to getting back and seeing what's changed. The first stop on Jack's journey is the capital city of his great-grandfather's homeland, Rome. Now that there's sort of a greater um, weight and meaning to the, to the trip, I understand what it really means to me, and what it means to Nono and Dad and Nono and all his side of the family. It's, um, I guess, it is their homeland. Um, and it, it's obviously meant a lot to them previously and, and still currently. And I think for that to get lost over time would be pretty naive and neglectful because it's been a, such an important part of our lives um, and it wouldn't have got us to where we are today. So I think now um, returning to Italy will have far greater significance than what it did when I was a kid. There's been that many generations of people before me and um, some really important people in Rome's history. The fact that it's 2,000 years old, I can't come to terms with because it's naive of me to think this, but I feel as though I've been alive for 18 years and that's all that I really know. I've got a, I guess, a vague understanding of what's gone on in the world before me, but not to the extent of 2,000 years before me. That's a, that's a long time. Yeah, it's, it's hard to comprehend. Quando ti guardo io non resisto ai tuoi occhi così blu. Tu non mi guardi io non resisto e continuo a cadere giù. Tu non mi guardi io non resisto e continuo a cadere giù. We're number two now, and it's a number that's brought a lot of success and to the club. Uh, John Nichols, our greatest player ever. Uh, five-time five best and fairest premiership captain. Um, was lucky enough to have him present the jumper to me. Um, there's been some great players who have worn the number two, so um, it is a massive number in the club's history. And um, it, yeah, it makes me proud to be able to represent it and, and represent the family's name too. When I was very young, uh, when Walks got given number one, I can't remember the exact words, but I said something along the lines of, you're wearing my number for when I come along. Um, so I think um, he's always remembered it. The number I've worn my whole junior footy career, um, my whole school footy career. So it does mean a lot to myself and the family, considering Nono and, and Dad wore it too. So you know, Dad wore it when he was a kid and then wore it when he was playing. And then me and my, my two other brothers too have worn it since we've been kids all the way through. Um, and it's even for passwords on phones and little things like that, it's just, it's a really significant number in the family. So it's, it, and it's not just us, it's extended family too. Like it's cousins on mum's side and um, dad's sisters. And it's just a really significant number in the family. I guess one day if I get the opportunity to pull it on, I'll take it with both hands and run with it because it's something I want to do and something I have been doing since I was a kid. Ogni giorno si mi sembra una festa Quando sto con te non c'è altro che resta Dubbed La Superba, or the Proud One, due to its impressive landmarks and rich history, Genoa is Italy's largest seaport with a population of 590,000. Its most famous native was Christopher Columbus, and it's also where Giacomo Silvani set off from in 1924. It's very different to Rome, almost a working class town, it's pretty industrialised. I guess from a small town like Asiago to coming to here, it'd be pretty daunting as it is, but first boat ride and you're dropping everything you know, you know and love, and going to another place, an even bigger place. 
um, with with a greater unknown, it's um, it would have been pretty daunting, no doubt. Um, having seen the records, I think he was one of I don't know how many five five or so people from around his area. I'm in such a fortunate position myself, where I've essentially been gifted everything through his work. <sighs> like the fact that at 22 years old you've dropped everything to start a new life abroad, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to get a grip uh, a, a grip of because it's such a difficult position to put yourself in. Me And you show what it's got on your kindy bag. Daddy. Daddy. What number's Daddy? Number one. Always back for Carlton. I was first born in my family, so uh, first grandchild uh, on Dad's side. Good boy. Oh, was that good? You gonna do some more? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the Carlton faithful were going through a reasonable period of of time, sort of 95 we won a flag, 99 we played in the grand final and I was born in 97 so um, I know that, that some of the first gifts that were brought to mum when she was in hospital were like little Carlton um, stuff footies and little Carlton jumpers and, and stuff like that so always Carlton were, were number one. Give me with everything, it doesn't matter what it is, so uh, I hate losing and I love to win. I think that's what I love most about footy, it's trying and trying to get there as much as you can and once you get there, the reward and um, the feeling of elation and euphoria almost. Well, watching Dad play, I'd, he's, he was a very courageous player. Mum is very competitive as well, she hates to lose. It's sort of been bred into me from both sides of the spectrum, paternal and maternal, so um, I don't think I could escape it in any way, shape or form. Mum um, keeps me in line because during the year if things aren't going, like if I'm injured or um, I'm struggling to get up for a game, I can get pretty intense and almost to the detriment of myself and my form because I'll try to do everything possible to get myself right and I won't sleep, I won't, I won't eat well, stuff like that just because I'm so hell bent on being able to play the best footy I possibly can. Um, so mum, dad, um, my, my closest mates keep me balanced too, they give me that balance between footy and life. My best mates know that I come to them for a, an escape from it all. Um, they'll give me a clip if I've played poorly too which is good, it keeps you grounded um, but they know that if I come to see them I'm just another mate from school I'm another mate from junior footy and they don't treat me any differently because of the position I'm in the fortunate position I'm in so and I wouldn't expect anything different and um, that's the way I want it I guess I use them as an escape from footy and I'm really grateful for it. Growing up as a Carlton supporter over the period I have without experiencing much success at all, it makes me, my ambitions for the future now as a player are more significant. I want to restore Carlton to its true place. Um, seeing vision of him accepting his premiership medals, um, yeah that makes me really want it, really really want to win a flag with this footy club because because it's so close to home, pretty jealous of that too. Asiago is the hometown of the Silvanus, a minor township of 6,500 people. It's located in the Veneto region of northeastern Italy in the foothills of the Alps. Jack has come to Asiago to find out more about the circumstances around his great grandfather's emigration to Australia. Jack has met with writer, historian, and Asiago native Giancarlo Bottoli to learn more about the Silvani family's connection to the town. You know, 
What means Silvani? No. Silvani became from Silvano. Okay. Is a name. Is a name. Sì. Silvano significa it means uomo man che viene we come from un bosco una selva 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 silvani selva selva bosco uomo che viene o che abita nella selva nel bosco come tutti noi una volta sì. la famiglia eh, le prime notizie è di 700 anni fa sì. first world war Asiago, caput. Questa sala, qui in cima, che andiamo dentro dopo, è la sala del consiglio, of the council, e ha sette archi, per ricordare i sette comuni. Seven communities. Yeah. Rozzo, Silvani. Rozzo, Rozzo. Rozzo. Uh, Silvani became from Rozzo. Okay. quattro grandi quadri che eh, ricordano la nostra storia, le antiche origini del nostro lavoro. Asiago, i sette comuni, nascono forse circa mille anni fa da immigrati che arrivavano dalla Germania. Per cui noi siamo tedeschi. Okay. Viene fatto uh, l'accordo con Venezia nel 1405. La fedeltà dei sette comuni verso Venezia nel caso che i sette comuni fossero stati invasi dai tedeschi. E Venezia in cambio dava esenzione fiscale. Era contenta perché sapeva che i confini, i confini erano governati, noi confinavamo con l'Austria. Poi Venezia comprava lana, formaggio, ma soprattutto legname. Quindi la nostra gente poteva lavorare perché riusciva a vendere i prodotti. Per portare il legname a Venezia, da qua, allora usavano un fiume. E quindi lavorare nel bosco era un'attività molto importante. Ecco perché tu sei Silvagni. Silvagni, uomo della selva. Okay. Eh, come avete visto nella foto, Asiago è stata distrutta. La popolazione civile è migrata tutta, portata in, in, dappertutto e hanno sofferto molto. La popolazione abile, cioè i maschi, andavano soldati, tutti i soldati, alpini. E sono morti tantissimi giovani. Fra questi i due fratelli Silvani, Antonio e Silvio. Silvio, Silvio Silvani. Okay. Sono morti che avevano poco più di vent'anni. Uno è morto sul fronte orientale, decorato con medaglia di bronzo e medaglia d'argento. Ha preso una pallottola, tante pallottole, una sul polmone e morto per la ferita. Eh, invece ehm, Antonio eh, ha avuto eh, la croce di guerra e eh, altre medaglie d'argento e è morto sull'Ortigara, sul monte Ortigara e in eh, pochi giorni sono morti 20.000, 20.000 morti e subito dopo la guerra il sindaco di Asiago che era un Silvagni ha fatto e il Consiglio ha deliberato di intitolare una via ai fratelli Silvani. Come era la città dopo poi la guerra? La città era ricostruita, ricostruita, rifatta, nuova, New Asiago, yeah. e grazie alla ricostruzione c'era il lavoro. C'era il lavoro. Tutti facevano i muratori, però. Finito il lavoro dei muratori, 
non c'è più lavoro. Allora, tantissimi emigrano all'estero. Dove? Comincia l'Australia, Brasile, Canada, Stati Uniti, Francia, Francia Germania. C'è la grande emigrazione. Questa grande emigrazione continuerà anche dopo la Seconda Guerra Mondiale, perché l'altopiano, la, la popolazione dei sette comuni, più o meno è 21.000. Quando supera questo tetto non c'è più lavoro. Se ci fosse stato lavoro, lui non sarebbe nato in Australia. Ti guardo io non resisto ai tuoi occhi così blu tu non mi Super insightful I had no idea what to expect going in because the knowledge we have of our family and our heritage has sort of diminished particularly um, since me and my brothers have come along um, so little is really known about um, sort of what we really stood for and what we did um, prior to Um, Giacomo migrating. The main thing that surprised me out of the chat was the fact that we're of German heritage, which really caught me by surprise because as far as I knew, I understand we had to come from somewhere, but I didn't know where. Really looking forward to telling Nuno because I don't think he'll believe me at all. He won't believe that we're German. I think it'll be an interesting conversation to have. I guess the meaning of the name too. I just thought I was Jack Silvani. I thought, you know, chances are It means something that I'd never really know the significance it had and what it meant, but to finally sort of come to grips with it all and be able to contextualise what the name actually means, um, it's pretty special. It means something more to me rather than just being a name, so I guess now I stand for something more. The fact that his whole migration story was due to the fact that essentially he was unemployed Um, that hit home because I guess the fact that had he not been out of work and had the war not struck and you know had everything been I probably wouldn't be in the position I am today I wouldn't be born for that to not have happened and it, it's pretty hard to imagine because like standing here now I'm in the place where my great-grandfather lived for him to come out to Australia. I'm fortunate for that because if he hadn't, you know, I wouldn't be alive. So, um, yeah, it's, it's something hard to think about. I guess to a certain extent, I ignored the fact that my parents had a profile. Around the house they were always mum and dad, they were never anything else. I was aware that dad played footy and um, mum was on TV and stuff, but it was never something that you know, I'd openly tell people or boast about or as a kid, you know, kids would try to go, oh yeah, your dad played footy, your mum was on TV and I'm like, yeah, so it's not worth being teased about because it's not something I'm ashamed of or anything like that. If someone tried to tease me, I'm not offended by it because it's a pretty proud thing, like it's something they should be proud of and I'm happy that they did it. I get told a lot by a lot of people, um, even friends' parents, that dad was their favourite player. And I can't, it's not something I can really fathom because dad was my favourite player. I just think of him as dad. He's never been anything else. I know what he did, but like I don't treat him any differently to how any other young kid would treat their own dad. You know, we wrestle, we, we have an argument every now and then, but you know, we get along, we love each other, and that's life. It's no different to any other kid. It's just the position he's in and what he did as a job. I love you, Daddy. Daddy, you are our champ. Yeah, he is my hero, but 
I don't like to tell him that because then he gets too much enjoyment out of it. The influence he's had on my life um, up to now has been profound because I wouldn't have been in the position I am without him and Mum. To this point, Jack has believed that he's embarked on this journey of exploration on his own. And despite an inkling that something might have been happening when communication to his family proved difficult for 24 hours, he had no idea what was awaiting him just around the corner on Via Silvani. I didn't think he'd understand the magnitude of how many Silvanis were still in the town. Do you feel anything being in this town you personally? I think now, definitely. Oh. Hello. Yeah. I told you. I told you. I knew it. Hello. I knew it for sure. Hello. How are you going? Good. That's good. You're the I same jacket. I have no doubt. I didn't know you were coming out. No. <laughs> <laughs> so how's it been? Good. It's been really good. So you know, we're German. We're German? Austrian, yeah. That's right. No, we're German. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, yeah. Silvio and Antonio, they were of really high importance in the town. Um, they were under 20 and were casualties of the First World War. And there was nothing to do. <laughs> See? Oh, my baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how hard was oh, to get this in? Because I knew as soon as you went quiet for three days. <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea. You See, got. I lied yeah. very well. Yeah. <laughs> After a quick catch up over lunch, the Silvani clan embarks on a pilgrimage of sorts to the childhood home of Giacomo, just outside the centre of Asiago. Although Serge and Stephen have seen the house before, none of the members of the family have ever set foot in it. For Jack, it's the first time visiting the place where it all began for his great grandfather. That's it. This one here. I didn't have a smokestack no. there. So that's almost a new section of it. Yeah, there'd be one, two, three, four. See, there's the four windows. One, two, three, four. Yeah, that's gone. See? I that's see they've knocked yeah. it off. They've you can see where they've taken it off. Yeah. That little... Yeah. It's amazing. Are you knocking on the door? So these were the people who were cousins of me mum. Yeah. And they got me, me mum to write to me dad. It's unbelievable. Signora, buongiorno. Sono nato in Australia. Sì. E siamo i Silvani. Sì. Ah sì. Sì, che è la signora che abitava qua, che era parente di mia suocera. Ah. E questa era a casa di Silvani. Grazie. She must have a carer. Because my mother got married to my dad by proxy. Yeah. They're running pen pals. Yeah. And just by phone. Yeah. And, and, and there's my mother before. So she must have been staying here with these cousins. Signora. Signora. Fiolo di Antonietta Vescovi. Ah, no, no. Sono parenti suoi. Quello è? Signora Silvani. Fiolo di Antonietta Vescovi. Fiolo di Antonietta, sì. Ah. Mi sono... Ti ricordi? Sì. Quello è la mamma del Giacomo. Ti ricordi del Giacomo Silvani? Sì. 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 E mi sono Fiolo del Giacomo. Giacomo. Ecco, siamo venuti a vedere la casa e si può fare delle fotografie che dispiace se che facciamo fare delle fotografie. Sì, sì, sì. Scusi, la Antonietta? Già la so. La mia mamma? Sì, la sua mamma. Sì, sì, sì. Sì, cugine, prime cugine, no. Ecco. Se mi dispiace, signora, se vedi la mamma alla casa. She's 94, she just remembered. I reckon my mother was probably here looking after him because my mother, she's 90 something, 94. My mother's 104, but she's dead now, but she would have been 104. So she would have been here looking after him. So we're going to go in. Yeah, we're going in. 
Look. Come on, Jack. <laughs> oh. 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 How's the size of it? Have a look at the size. Well, I found a photo. I don't know what it means. This goes through to another room. Oh, he must have been doing his war service yeah. on Pini. See, and it's got the Fletcher Club. See, they got the arrows. Yeah, that's where they were doing the Alpine yeah, the service, the troops. Yeah. Where'd you find that? Jack found it. We'll go up and have a look. Yeah. Come on. Let's go. Oh, this is weird. It's creepy. Size. How's the timber? Yeah, they're just logs, aren't they? Huh? Look at them. Oh. Oh. It's a, oh, it's unbelievable. Incredible, isn't it? Oh. How was your trip from Australia? Like the 13 hour flight and six and a half hour flight? Imagine a local farmer going to Australia from here. Oh. Oh. On a boat. On a boat. Just depending on meeting somebody there when you get there. Oh, incredible. I remember um, one day where um, at school we'd play markers up. I'd always try to take hangers and if it fell to ground being competitive as I am, I'd, um, I'd follow up and try to kick a goal and um, one kid sort of cracked it at me and I told the teacher and I got in trouble for getting too much of the ball. For a teacher to tell me off for getting too much of the footy, I thought that was unreasonable. And I remember it was when mum and dad were away and I would have been in year four, so I would have been 10. And I was crying on the phone to them, saying I just wanted to be normal. I just wanted to be a normal kid, like it's not fair. And then I, I played probably my worst junior footy game ever that weekend. That was when I realised like, no, I don't want to be normal. I've been blessed to be in the position I'm in. So I've got to make the most of it. I can't suck about it because it's not an unfortunate position at all. It's it's um, more than lucky and a lot a lot better than what a lot of other people around the world are sort of stuck with. So I think that was a pretty defining moment for me. But yeah well with dad I guess even normal too um, there is, there is a little bit of pressure, but I've never bought into it. Um, I, I know at one stage, probably under 13s, under 14s, sort of hit a, a big lull um, in junior footy. Dad and Nuno are pretty critical of my game. So how are you going to approach the game tomorrow, Jack? As Dad always says, bring the ball and make the tackle. And um, we'll really What do I say? Which is good because I wouldn't have it any other way. Because you don't want to fall into the trap of being content with mediocrity. But I did think, what if it doesn't happen? I'm not getting a kick and it's junior footy. Year 11, I played down back and I really enjoyed it. And then um, I got told by people I respect, um, mate's parents, and they're saying, I can't believe how much you move like your dad. And, really similar to the way that your dad played now I'm thinking, you know, if I keep doing what I'm doing and you know, work on the deficiencies, I could be a chance here. So I think I like hearing that I've, I've got this sort of similar gait as my, as my old man, um, but I am trying to be Jack Silvani and not Steve's son. Um, so I understand that people may think there's a pressure involved but a lot of the time, the most amount of pressure I feel is that I put on myself. So um, there's no doubt I want to live up to the name because it is a lot to live up to, but um, buying into external noise isn't going to help that.
and something I'm sort of trying to move away from and create my own path. After a couple of days exploring Asiago and its surrounds, the family makes its way to the birthplace of Jack's grandmother, Rita Silvani. Morostica, a medieval town located 30 kilometres southeast of Asiago, has a population of 13,000 people. So what was life like here, post-war? Oh, well, see, I was little for the first few years. I, I knew there wasn't much food around. We yeah. sort of had to go to the farmers and sort of luckily we knew some farmers and we were able to buy vegetables, meat and, and that. So, yeah. But the food, there wasn't that much around. This one here uh, was a shoe shop, it was my grandfather at yep. first. And then when my grandfather died, my father ran it. Yep. Till 1950, my father went to, uh, to Australia. Yeah. So you've told me stories about how um, back in the days with obviously the German influence in Northern Italy being pretty strong, um, there were alarm bells that would ring throughout the town. Yes. And you'd have to run up to the bunkers or the yes, castle? Yes, yes, it was a bunkers, which is, you know, the street that we live in, you sort yep. of go up and we had to run and you go underneath. And I can remember that, I was only little, but I can remember going in there. Yep. And uh, so it was a bit scary, but, mm -hmm. and I can remember even the German coming through yep. in the front of the house. So once it all, settled down, yeah. everything settled down from the war. Um, it must have been a pretty special place to live, similar to a fairy tale. Obviously you've got the castle, it's a pretty picturesque sort of we little used, town. We then. used to go playing up there, we used to run up a lot. And in winter, we used to go on the other side of the castle, which is the mountain. And it was a, when the snow was there, we used to go down sort of skiing or, or we just have some fun, that's yeah. all. And then, obviously, opposing that with your move to Australia, which is concrete jungle in, in some ways. Um, you don't have these sort of things from where we're living now. Yes, it was, it was different, but I sort of didn't sort of notice, you know, I didn't miss sort of that at first. I missed, uh, you know, the language, it was hard, settling in at school. It was completely different. Mm. It took me a long time to get back here. It was after 28 years I came back. Yeah. 11 and a half, and you couldn't speak a lick of English. Nothing. You didn't really know anyone other than your family coming out. That's right. And moving to Australia in that time as a foreigner would have been... Very hard. Yeah. And it was very hard at school because, you know, you sort of sat. And for six months, I just sat in the desk and doing nothing. And it, nobody gave you any help, even, the, even if I went to a Catholic school, the nuns sort of didn't have him much patience with you. But anyway, what I started doing, started mixing the Hekonses on. I said, well, yeah. I'm going to do it. I play netball with them. I went into the team, I made the team. So I was sort of trying to fit in and that sort of kept going. And then years went by and you met Nuno? Yes. Yes, how did that eventuate? Well, his sister actually planned it. She sort of made me, um, she came to meet him. We went to the beach the first time. Yeah. And uh, then we went out for dinner the second time. Did he have a nice body? I, did, I was too scared to look at his body. <laughs> he, he probably did, yeah. And uh, so, that's how I met him and then we started going out and we got married, well engaged after 12 months and got married the next 12 months, so two years. Yeah, he doesn't have a nice body anymore though, does nah, he? Nah, nah, he's <laughs> lost it all. So where did you live when you first got to Australia? Carlton, right down Street, Carlton. And Nuno lived in Canning Street? Canning Street, yes. Well that's handy, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so having watched Nuno, Dad and myself play, um, as, a, as an observer and a keen one at that, is it harder being a wife, a mother or a grandmother? Well, I say mother and grandmother. Because when I met Nuno, he was playing and you sort of expected. 
you know, now when you're, you've got your son playing every, you sort of worry, even your grandson, I'm starting to worry like I was worrying when your dad was playing. So I think mother and grandmother's the hardest. Yeah. When the leaves are all gone yeah. in winter, you can see it. But then it's grown since the first time you come up home here. Yeah, definitely. Right. Right. No, no, fine, fine. Oh, I can't look. <laughs> so gentleman. Oh, wow. At least I got one gentleman in the home. <laughs> He's stubborn, no, no, like his mother. His, no, no, what no, hope have I got? Both my parents are stubborn. No, no, no Jack wasn't <laughs> stubborn. No, no, Jack, actually, no, no, Jack was really a gentleman. Yeah. He was, oh, he was, he was, so, he was so lovely. Oh, look, I, I can't say a bad word about him. Yeah. He would have given me the world. If yeah. I would have said, give me that, he'll give it to me. The final destination on Jack's Italian adventure is La Serenissima Venezia. Venice is known for its history, art and world famous canals. With the whistles of pre-season training beckoning him back to Melbourne, Jack takes a moment on his final night in Italy to chat to his dad and Nonno about the moments they shared on the trip. Great to go back to Asiago because I really hadn't got into that house where the uh, old lady who mm. was related to me mother and the sort of ones who set up the, the friendship between me dad and her, oh, that, that was just incredible. I didn't think anybody would be alive who could sort of remember my mum around that time mm. and that was sensational. I mean I'd been to um, Nonal's place before but I'd never had the chance to go inside so just to realise how low the ceilings were as well, um, the doorways. But uh, yeah, an amazing experience. What about yourself, Jack? I think all the history behind our lineage was probably what I found most interesting. The fact that originally we've come from German descent, like we're German migrants coming to Italy. The history behind um, Via Silvani, and yeah, I think all the historical aspect of it, particularly uh, the history of the name and our ancestors is what interests me most. Uh, Jack, I've actually been asked by uh, Walks and also the club whether you'd like to wear the number one jumper going forward. So it's a decision you have to make. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to pull on the number one jumper. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's such a proud um, jumper from the club and uh, obviously family ties as well um, make it all the more special. It's the number I've won, you know, through my whole junior footy career. So I think um, whilst number two served me well over my first year, I think the pull on number one will mean a little bit more next year. Oh, you got my hand I feel like I've got a greater understanding of what he did and the influence he's had on the family and I guess our lives as a collective. All the knowledge that I've picked up along the way that I wouldn't I don't think any of Nun or Dad would have known either um, has been massive because it was, I didn't know what to expect coming in. To know that um, there's a greater story behind it and the family's respected amongst that city for more than Dad and Nunal's football exploits. Mm -hmm. To know that and then understand the importance of the Silvani name in that town and then for Nono Jack to come under extreme duress in the position he was in to give us what we've got now, I think to provide the life that we've had and will have for 
hopefully a long time now. I can't thank him enough. There were no flies on Frank But the clock 